Hundreds of years ago, the wealth of the American South built enormous mansions and vast plantations of cotton, tobacco, and sugar. That all came at a cost, of course, a deeply felt human cost, paid with thousands upon thousands of black lives, enslaved men, women, and children taken from Africa and brought to America through the ports of Savannah, Beaufort, and Charleston. The enslaved persons brought their agricultural know-how with them, and crops like rice, okra, and yams thrived under their expertise. We're here today with B.J. Dennis, a Charleston-based chef and historian who's not only a great cook, he's dedicated much of his professional life to preserving the low country culinary traditions of his ancestors, the Gullah or Geechee people of the Sea Islands off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, B.J., thank you for bringing me here. Brought you to one of the hearts of Gullah, culture. First of all, what is what does that mean? Gullah, I hear Gullah, Geechee, is that the same thing? Well, you know, in, in, on the Sea Islands of Georgia, they'll say they Geechee. Mm -hmm. uh, South Carolina, they say we Gullah. But in the city of Charleston, we say we Geechee. It's all the same culture. Okay. A language, music, food, the Africanisms that we held on to that came from West Africa and the West Indies. That's pretty much the heartbeat of Gullah culture. It stayed on the Sea Islands because the Sea Islands were very um, separated from the mainland. And through that, we held on to a lot of our Africanisms. The ring shout, praise house, uh, the food, which you get ready to taste. Mm. And on Edison Island, Miss Emily is probably the matriarch of this island. She's a living legend. This 85-year-old woman who still cooks for 100 plus. Cooking on the island since her younger days, for me, is nothing better than sitting with my elders because they have so much to share with me. And that's why I brought you here. Hello. I'm gonna wipe my feet before I come in the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how you doing? I'm here. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Hi there, Hi. I'm Lucas. It's nice to meet you. Same here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. Yes. I'm doing this, she's been doing this way before I, I was even a thought. You know I won't get any more authentic than what we got about to do right here with her, so. Well, we're gonna do parsley rice. You don't see that no way in the restaurant, or? You're gonna do red rice, broccoli, cauliflower, carrot salad, stuff waiting. Or spotted bass? Spotted bass. Spotted bass, yes. It's spotted season, so they're nice and yes. fresh. Yeah, she gonna lead us, she gonna lead us to, the, to where we need to be, so. Well, join the band. Hey, put me to work. Tell me what to do, or tell me to get out of the way. I'll tell you what you can do. Great. Wash this. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, DJ, you know what I want you to do for me? Yes, ma'am. I want you to cut me some parsley. Miss Emily, what are you making right now? Parsley rice and red rice. You were born and raised on this island. Right here on this island. Mm -hmm. And five or six generations of your family before you, yeah? Yes. This is the most blessed place in the world. Because everybody that lives here, they look up to each other. Look right in that cat that you see a can of made a piece. Now, I've heard people call you the queen of this island. <laughs> Really? That's what some people say. <laughs> Why do you think they call you that? I guess because I am the most caring person for the island. And I love to take care of people. I've been doing that all my life, and I like to cook and feed people. I worked in one spot for 46 winters and had six children and never missed a day for work. Wow. <laughs> Did you believe that? I went there as a little girl washing the dishes in the kitchen. And then 20 years later, the cook died, the housekeeper died, so then everything fell in my lap. You know, every day I go, I said, I'm not coming back tomorrow because it's too much. <laughs> Have you heard of red rice before? The same family as jambalaya, which also goes back to the lineage of uh, jollof. Okay. They say the sign of a great cook in Charleston is how your red rice come out. What's tricky about it? That the tomato to water ratio is key. Don't ever put too much tomatoes, because if you put too much tomatoes, it come out red, red, red. Too tomatoey, if that's a word. Sure. <laughs> we are pretty much the descendants of folks who came from the rice growing areas of West Africa. Right. You know, Senegal is known for chabu gin, okay. which is their national dish, which a lot of folks say is the beginning of the whole jollof rice. Okay. But it started in Senegal with chabu gin, which is a Senegalese rice and fish dish. Typically a red tinted rice with tomato paste or fresh tomatoes. And we usually do red rice here with fried fish, and rice was pretty much what made this city rich. Unfortunately, it was, we became rich off the knowledge and the culture of the West Africans. So we have right here Creole rice from Trinidad, Maruga Hill rice. The Americans are an um, ethnic group in Trinidad. 
They are descendants of Gullah Geechee people from the Low Country, uh, particularly in Georgia and here in South Carolina. Um, they're called Americans because when they went to Trinidad, people knew they were from the States. Mm. And with them, they took those rice. We thought that this may be related to the West African Glabarima rice. Okay. Well, a lot of people think of rice with Asia. Rice also in West Africa goes back seven, 8,000 million. So this is Sea Island white rice peas and okra. You're gonna be amazed. Her gonna do magic now. Right in the front of your eye. She's gonna stuff this into this beautiful spot tail. Fillet the bone, she's gonna sew it. And bring me the rice. I need somebody to hold it for me. I'll hold it for you. Okay. Like a little baby. Mm -hmm. A little baby fish. Have you ever seen this before? Never. Press it, let me see. Press it in? Yeah, press it in. This is the real thing, Long. This is it. Get your hands in it. That's right. Doctor is going to operate now. Everything is so still. <laughs> so still like everybody. It's like you're doing surgery. Everyone <laughs> has to be very quiet. Now look right up there on that sink. Yeah. You see an apple? Yes. Wash that apple off and cut it in half on it. Okay. Scoop that Scoop up. Scoop that out. Okay. Do that. Bring it here. There's a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> Man, I'm going to fire you. I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> Poor Apple. I take, know, I know. He takes 15 minutes. <laughs> I just wanted it to be perfect for you. Pour me some juice right here. Okay. Okay, that's enough. All right, pour that juice in there. What is it about the connection with food that's so important with your culture and with Miss Emily's culture? You no, know, it's a really direct connection back to the motherland. The rice, the okra, the eggplant, the one pot cooking, the slow cooking. Well, these things are so synonymous to how they eat in West Africa. You know, a lot of these dishes you only saw at home. You didn't really see them in the mainstream restaurants. You know, Charleston in particular, and the Sea Islands, be it from working class, even in the quote-unquote homes of the elite, this was the cuisine that they would eat. Charleston at that time was 70% free and enslaved people. Their culture kind of was the heartbeat, even though it was suppressed mm -hmm. through food. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's food and don't, try to mix in politics or history, but the fact is it's so connected. And so how do you discuss Southern cuisine? I think to, for me as a chef, I have an obligation to talk about these stories. I can't just cook this food or go back and look at the past, look at old recipes without knowing that some people, they were house slaves. Sometimes if you burnt something, that was a punishment. They had to be great cooks. I call it suppressed greatness. Mm. You have free people too, who own restaurants and hotels in Charleston. Okay. During that time period too. And their stories are not talked about either. Charleston and New Orleans enslavement in these cities were very different than a lot of other places. Because you had the market where it was people of color who sold the goods, sold the vegetables, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes eventually be, be able to buy their own freedom. The story is so complex and food takes it in so many directions. And like, for me, in this world now with all the social media and all this, I've been blessed to get a lot of notoriety from that. But there were people before me who've been doing this. Mm. And if I don't use my platform to showcase those who've been doing this work, then I'm at fault. I want to be around the elders. I want to hear them crack, crack the teeth. <laughs> and crack the teeth is when they talk. I want to hear them talk. When they crack the teeth, I want to hear them talk. What do we need to do as people in the food community to honor the past? Acknowledge the roots of what you're doing sometimes, and that's not for everybody, you know. And I, and I, and I have to admit that that I had a passion for culture and, and history, especially knowing my history and my roots. And I happen to be a, a, a cook. Mm -hmm. If I could say one thing, it is know what you're cooking sometimes. I mean, like, you won't believe how many chefs think gumbo comes from France, <laughs> and what gumbo is an African word for okra, you know. Sometimes we got to stop and, and study. Sometimes it's more than just cooking, you know, because the food tells a story. Miss Emily's a one-woman wrecking crew here. What are we making now? Icing for the rum cake. Mm. Brown sugar. That's right. Um, I need some butter. Okay. Get 
Can I grind all of them? Yes, you can. Now you have never tasted anything like this. You think you're dying going to heaven. Put it on. Does that look good? We are so lucky and fortunate to be here with this amazing spread of food prepared by Miss Emily. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Could you just tell us what we've got here? You got stuffed spotted bass with parsley rice. You got red rice, brown rice. You got vegetable salad and a lemon cake. And then what is in these mysterious jars? Some homemade muscadine wine. And this looks so good. I, I think we should. I think we should eat it. Let's see the blessing. Mm -hmm. Lord, make us thankful for this food that we are about to receive to nourish our body, but not our soul. Make us mindful of those that are less fortunate than we are. Thank you for family and friends. These and all other blessings are messing in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd love to talk a little bit about food traditions here on the island, preserving those traditions. But I don't know if these young folks are going to carry on this tradition because see, the parents still cook this kind of food and the kids substitute. When I were coming up, whatever our parents put on that table, if you didn't eat, you'd go to bed hungry. How does it make you feel when you see younger people like like BJ wanting to prepare these kinds of foods and, and keep these things alive? Good. Makes you feel good because you know what? Somebody have to carry on. But he, he ain't everybody gonna do that. Tell us a little bit about some of the significance culturally of some of the dishes that we're eating. We we'll start with, the, with this red rice. I mean, red rice and jambalaya are very similar. This rice right here came from the low country and, and went to Trinidad in the 1800s. And then this dish, you know, to me is a special. So you're getting the kind of full gamut. I mean, what's interesting is having so much going on in one dish. It was indicative of the culture. Mm -hmm. Slow cooking, one pot meals. Everything you need is in one pot. Our grandparents taught us to love and to share. And you know, love is such a powerful word. Big and powerful. Some of the black don't know it. Some of the white don't know it. They don't know, they don't know what that word means to say love. But if they just can pick up this year and turn it down for a new world and a new time, mm -hmm. it will be a beautiful world to live in. Because you know one thing? You will learn how to share, you will learn how to care, and to love other people. I think food is maybe that one common denominator that can bring everybody to the table. I'm, I'm seeing it. I mean, I'm seeing people who my age and younger who say, wait a minute, let's embrace our culture and our roots. And I'm fortunate to still be able to live in the culture and be able to go and sit with somebody like Miss Emily, sit, or sit with my grandmother who's 90, 91, mm -hmm. and just have a conversation. I don't know how much longer I'll be able to hear those voices. And then soon it's going to be me at that spot, you know, if I'm blessed enough to get to that point. And I want to be able to give the things that I've been told to that next generation. BJ, we're just, we're here on the porch, rocking chairs with <laughs> the legend of the islands, Miss Emily. I, what does being here do, do for you? Gives me a peace of mind. I'm at ease. Every other thing that I got going on, you know, trying to get this, this gig and do this, that all goes away. The meal that you prepared for us was... Love it. It was so delicious. Well, glad you enjoyed it. The red rice, that stuffed, beautiful stuffed fish, the parsley rice, there was a, there's a lot of rice. Mm -hmm. That's the tradition for the, for the island is rice. Yeah. Absolute honor. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you, Miss Emily, for allowing me to visit you and to help you make this beautiful meal, even though I almost messed it up. <laughs> it was amazing to learn from you, seriously. I, it, it was incredible to watch you work, and it's been a real pleasure. Well, it was a pleasure having you all. <laughs>